Good morning. Welcome to worship at Winter Park Presbyterian Church. What a delight to be with you today. We hope the service is a blessing to you no matter where you might be listening to the service today. Uh, we hope that indeed God will uh, filter down into those spaces in your life and in your heart and continue to make you whole. Now as we begin to worship, let us pray. O oh, loving and gracious God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would indeed invade our, invade our hearts and our lives and our minds, that you would send forth uh, goodness into our lives, that indeed we might reflect that outward into the world. O oh, Lord, be with us as we gather for worship and tether us together by the Holy Spirit, no matter where we may be this morning geographically, or spiritually. We pray that you would indeed be with us. And we ask these things today in the name of the living one, your son, our blessed Savior and Redeemer, Jesus the Christ. Amen. us to have the kids come in a little closer so that we can have a nice special moment. I have two very special things in my bag this morning. Let's take a look. I brought with me something you might have seen before. That is an ordinary flashlight. You can see it goes on and off and a dish towel. I wonder Right now, the flashlight is off, but if I put it under this dish towel and flick it just a couple of times, I don't know, what do you think? Is the light on or is it off? Should we find out? Let's see. The light was off, but if we turn it on and cover it, can you tell that the light is on? No because we have something covering the light and keeping it from shining. 
We have flashlights so that in scary times or times when it's dark, like during a storm or maybe even in the middle of the night if we're out camping, we have something to shine a light around us. Today, I want to tell you a story about two children. One, a little boy that absolutely loved to dance, and a little girl who loved to play soccer. You see, the little boy who loved to dance always wanted to show his friends all the cool things he could do while he was dancing. But you know what his friends said? They said, we don't want to see it. And so the little boy never got to share his dancing, and he was very, very sad. But the little girl who liked to play soccer, she always wanted her friends to see her. And so her friends came to every single game that she had. They brought signs with them every single time that were cheering her along. And so she got better and better and better at soccer. We all have a light inside of us, some sort of special talent that we can share with everybody. Now, the little boy in our story, he had a special light, and that light was dancing, but his friends covered up his light so that he could never share it with them. But the little girl in our story, her friends helped her to share her light with everybody, and so she got to share her talent. These things are very good things. Helping people and encouraging people to share whatever light they have inside of them is some of the best thing that we can do, and that is what God wants for us. God wants us to be the best that we can be, to be good, to share our light with others so that they are comfortable sharing their light with us. As we go about our week, my special challenge for you this week is to share your light with somebody else, to do something good for that person, to help their light come out. That might be encouraging them in some way. That might be telling them that they are super, super duper good at something. That might be cheering them on even if it is from a distance so that we can help everybody to shine their light just the way that God wants us to. Let's fold our hands, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Repeat after me, dear God, thank you for giving us all such a special light. Help us to know what light we have, to share it with the world, and make us into good people who help others share their light with the world. In your name we pray. Amen. And now let us bring all of our joys and concerns for this week before God in prayer. Let us pray. Mighty God, you have given us the ability to see light in the midst of dark, to find joy in times of sorrow, to see the good in life, even when others only see bad. You have given us these abilities with one command to go with them, share. You have taught us to share our light, our joy, our goodness with others so that they too might become followers of the light, partakers of joy and creators of goodness. On this morning, our prayers extend to all who have been part of our lives and shared these precious gifts with us, to those who care for us, to those who nurture us, to those who teach us, who lead us, and those who protect us. Help us to follow their example, even in the most difficult of times. Help us to share what we have, 
so that others may be blessed. Sympathetic sovereign, you have given us these gifts, but you have not made us to be ignorant or naive to the world around us. You have created us to feel, to understand emotions, to share in times of darkness or sorrow or great difficulty. And so we lift up those situations to you now, asking for healing, for comfort, or relief wherever it may be needed in the world. For those who live in poverty or with food insecurity, for those who are unemployed, those who are homeless, for any who may be sick or injured or preparing for death. We pray for those who face war, whether it is in their country, on a battlefield, in a courtroom, or in their own home. We pray for any who feel trapped, any who are lonely, we pray for those who feel that they are not equal and who fight for change. We pray for those who are without love and joy and goodness. Send help to them swiftly, great God. Meet their needs just as you have met ours. Loving Lord, you have given us the ability to see light in the dark to find joy in sorrow, and to possess good in times of trial, for you are light and joy and goodness. As we move forward throughout our day and throughout our week, help to remind us of these gifts you have granted us. Help us to find ways to use them. Help us to be goodness, just as you created in your holy and everlasting name, we pray for these things. Amen. Our scripture readings for today are, of course, from the Old and New Testament. From the Old Testament today, a proverb from the 12th chapter, beginning at the 14th verse. From the fruit of his lips, a man is filled with good things as surely as the work of his hands rewards him. And then into the New Testament, to Luke's Gospel, the 11th chapter, beginning at about the 33rd verse. Listen for God's word to you here today. This is Jesus speaking. These are those red letters that we encounter in the scriptures. Jesus says, no one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, he puts it on its stand so that those who come in may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are good, your whole body also is filled with light. But when they are bad, your body is also filled with darkness. So to it then, see to it then, that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be completely lit as when the light of a lamp shines on you. And then our focus verse for this particular series of sermons from the letter to the church at Galatia, Paul writes, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. The grass withers and the flowers fade from life. But according to the prophet Isaiah, the word of the Lord will endure forever and ever, friends. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. 
O Holy Spirit, open our minds today that we might understand something of your word to us. Open our hearts that we might sense and know your presence among us today. And open our eyes that we might see Jesus in his goodness and in his glory. Amen. Well, oh my goodness. One would think a sermon on goodness would be a piece of cake, a no-brainer, a slam dunk, or easy peasy. Jesus is good, so we should be good. Go out there and do some good. Make good choices. Focus on good things. Or in the words of men at work, be good, be good, be good, be good, be good, Johnny. Right? The problem arises for us in the translation from the theoretical to the practical. Obviously, goodness up amid the ivory towers of academia and theology and philosophy is a beautiful and a marvelous idea. But translating that into daily, minute-by-minute minute living is, well, let's be honest, it's difficult. This word, this idea, this fruit of God's Spirit described as goodness proves to be slippery. Mentally we grasp it, but frequently it oozes between our fingers and the residue is a bit sticky as we try and live it out day by day. The actual word this morning from Galatians for goodness is only used four times in the entire Bible. And when you look this word up, it says uprightness of heart and life. And then it says goodness. I don't know about you, but I would have gotten an F for using the word itself in the definition. So really not much insight there because, after all, what's an upright life? What was once considered good and honorable, an upright life, is in today's cultural vernacular antiquated or outdated thinking and behavior. After all, who defines what's good and upright? I shared something with a person one time, things about goodness, suggesting that living out goodness is best defined for us in the Ten Commandments. The first five, which help us to live, to have a goodness, to have an uprightness of heart in our relationship with God. And the last five, a goodness or an uprightness of heart with our neighbor. A few days later, I got an email saying, in essence, they didn't believe in the Bible. What else could I offer them? I replied, the world is full of isms. Take your pick. So goodness in the cultural sense can be based on anything. What is seen as good to this group is bad for that group. What was right is now wrong. And when I grew up, bad actually meant good. For example, somebody might get a new set of rims on their car and you'd say, man, those are bad. It's confusing. It's not just semantics when it comes to goodness we actually discover that goodness can be divisive. When defining goodness, when practicing goodness, we really run up against the walls of two cities. 
The cities are the city of God and the city of humanity. Depending on which city you choose to reside in, your concepts about goodness and what defines an upright heart are drastically different. For example, if money is believed to solve a societal ill, and this is a view held by many today, if money or material stuff is believed to be the ultimate fix for this problem or that problem or will satisfy this need or that need or repair that cultural rift or divide, then what comes next is simply the need for more money. Why? Because something is missing. Money, resources, material things are tools that God gives us that are to be used, even to be shared. But without God at the center, our attempts end up being the dangling carrot of a secular humanist utopia. Our godless efforts end up hemming us in within the walls of the city of humanity. The Jewish people, upon their departure from Egypt, plundered the Egyptians. You can read about it in the 12th chapter of Exodus, and I encourage you to do so. But this wealth proves not to be enough. Something is missing. So after a while, they use their gold to create something to worship. In particular, they create a golden calf. The golden calf was a symbol for Baal worship during this time. And if you're interested in those sort of things, you can trace that back all the way to Genesis, to Nimrod, and to others. It's worthwhile understanding the origins of these things because when they creep up inside us, and they do, the source and the patterns are recognizable. They exist in the city of humanity. Eventually, the Passover story and the historical events around the Exodus begins to shape the people's understanding. These begin to define the cultural consciousness as redemptive patterns of God emerge in their lives amid a terrible historical context. They are moved from the frenetic quest and pursuit of material gain to a posture, to an attitude of repentance and love of God. This occurs over decades, centuries even. Sometimes it can be seen as a steady progressive thing. Other times it's spasmodic at moments unexpected, at times when all seemed lost. There's great leaps during this time and two steps forward and five steps back during other times. But when one examines their experience, as a whole, a redemptive pattern of grace begins to emerge time and time and time again, seemingly without end. Compared to the goodness of the city of God that lights the hearts of all people, the city of humanity seems so dim and yet, so many choose to reside there. In all honesty, we all have dual citizenship in both places. 
Our fragmented nature sees to that at times. But the idea, the goal, would be that we would live in God's city as much as possible. You know, kind of like snowbirds. Ten months here and two months there. Growing up, and even today, I hear lots of stories from people about how God turned their lives around. I even have one of those stories. And most seem to follow a certain order. I was bad doing this and this and this, and then I met Jesus, who is good. My life changed, and now I'm good. And of course, good is defined as I don't do this and this and this anymore. A guy named Paul had one of those encounters with Jesus. But when you read his mail, which is the majority of what we call the New Testament, this formula looks very different. To be honest, it's a formula that I identify with. Paul's formula is I was bad. I met Jesus who is goodness incarnate. My life changed and now I struggle with goodness. Or as expressed in his mail to the Romans, paraphrased by Eugene Peterson's The Message, listen as Paul shares his heart with us this morning. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this your experience also? Yes, I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another. Doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's commandments are necessary. But I need something more. For if I know the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me, and it gets the better of me every single time. It happens so regularly that it's, it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything, and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with my whole heart and mind, but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something 
totally different. End quote. Being good. Being good, Johnny. Ain't no slam dunk. In other words, if at the end of the day I'm measured by my goodness, I'm coming up short every time. But it's not about my goodness at the end of the day, and it's not about yours. It's about the goodness of God. Goodness poured out from a cross unto death. Goodness found alive amid an empty grave, and goodness showered upon us in the redemptive rhythms of grace even up into this very moment. Our New Testament reading reminds us that in Christ Jesus, God has placed a light within us. A light that shines in love and joy and peace, but a light that also shines God's goodness. So don't go crawling around and hiding in the alleyways in the city of humanity, but rather hear the good news and stand amid life, be present amid the circumstance to which God has called you. Be mindful of what you watch and what you listen to. After all, it's garbage in, garbage out. But most of all, don't just do something. Stand there and let the light of God's Son reflect off of you. Let His goodness shine amid the darkness. I mentioned this word goodness only being used four times and being defined in a rather limited way. However, if you look up the root of this word, it's used over 90 times in the Bible. And in a couple of places, it's translated fertile soil. I would submit today that if the fruit of the Spirit is to bloom in our lives, it's only possible being first rooted in the fertile soil of goodness, the fertile, fertile soil of the goodness of God. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, Shine forth the goodness of God upon us and then help us reflect that light, the light of the world amid the darkness. Amen. Wherever you are, I invite you to stand and join me in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God calls us to be a light of goodness in our world. So in humility, let us make our offering to God, trusting not in worldly gain, but in God's sustaining grace. Let us share our tithes and offerings.
pray. Bless in every way, O Lord, the gifts that the people have given. Enrich the ministries of your people and make us grateful to be able to let go of things that we do not need so that they may go to your goodness in this world. We pray for this using the words your Son taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. think about goodness and reflecting that out into the world, I brought with me this morning a prism, a very common item. Prism is a remarkable thing because when you shine light through it on one side, it's broken down and refracted out on the other side in its individual colors. You know, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue indigo and violet. Might I suggest this morning that we're like this prism and that when we let the light of Christ shine through us, it's refracted out into the world and to God's beautiful array of love and joy and peace, goodness, gentleness, patience, it's refracted out of us so that others may see. Friends, I pray that we will take what we have heard here today and that we will let the light of Christ shine through us, that indeed it might reflect the beautiful colors of the gospel out into a very colorless and drab and dark world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, may we go forth and share the gospel. May we go forth sharing the goodness of God using words if we absolutely must. Amen. <laughs>